Good evening, everyone. My name is Jean-Al Gurley. I'm the Director of Science and Programs here at Mariah Mitchell Association. And thank you so much for joining us this evening, even though we were running just a few minutes behind. We had a little technical hiccups, but we have navigated them just like we navigated the pandemic with tech issues as teachers. And I, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Amy Hinson this evening, our featured science speaker series for International Women's Month, as well as our second science speaker series in our 2023 offerings of presentations this year. And just a little background and introduction for our featured guest tonight. Dr. Amy Hinson is a distinguished educator of sciences at Nantucket High School here, right here on Nantucket. She is my dear friend and one of my most esteemed colleagues that I have previously worked with and learned from. And I just admire her intelligence and her knowledge and all of her skills and expertise so much. She has definitely fostered, rather, fostered a passion and love for science through her course offerings at Nantucket High School but most notably so in her forensic science course. Dr. Henson is a postdoctoral fellow at EL postdoctoral program where she focused on biochemistry and molecular biophysics with an emphatic research application in neuroscience. Amy has lived and resided on Nantucket since 2001. She has educated and continues to educate the youth of Nantucket and many aspiring future scientists in hopes that they too will find a path in sciences. Amy is the daughter of a former educator and a former NASA engineer. Her scientific and critical thinking skills are indeed molecular. We can even say that it might be genetic. <laughs> Amy has also educated and raised four children who have also gone through the Nantucket public school system. And without further ado, it is my sincere and utmost pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Amy Henson. Amy, welcome to our science speaker series at Martin Mitchell Association this evening. How are you? I am well. Thank you so much. What a wonderful and humbling introduction. Um, and indeed, you are a dear friend. Um, and um, obviously, we met through through education and for our love of science. So I think it's a, quite an organic friendship. Um, and I'm excited to be here tonight. Um, we did have a few technical difficulties. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to. I can certainly talk, but it's better to talk um, with pictures. Um, so we'll see. Um, did you get that? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Which email did you send it to? Um, I think the one at Mariah Mitchell. Perfect. I do have them. So what I will do is I will shut my camera off after I thank our sponsors and I will start to share your slide presentation and you can okay. introduce your talk. It's only like 14 slides. It's just something for them to look at so for, for our guests and welcome everybody. And gosh, thank you all for, for coming. I, um, I I feel honored to to talk about this with you all. So. All right, I'm going to stop share and I realize that I did not hit record, <laughs> but it might already be doing that, which is perfect. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna kick my camera and my microphone off and everyone, thank you again for joining us this evening. Dr. Amy Henson. All right. Hi everybody. Um, uh, it, it took me a little while to figure out what I wanted to talk about tonight, but um, uh, in in thinking about it, I thought you know forensic science is something that was um, that was given to me when I started to teach at the high school, and uh, when I started eight years ago, I had uh, one semester class of twelve students, um, followed by a second semester um, class with maybe another thirteen or so students. So it was quite small, um, uh, but it was something that that uh, our administration felt pretty strongly about teaching. So I took it on. Um, having never had um, a forensics class or any schooling or anything in forensics, um, I, I learned just like everybody else did that year. Um, after that year, I, I uh, turned that semester class into a full year class because I realized and I convinced the administration that there was so much, you can leave it on the first one if you want, there was so much to, um, to, to talk about and for the students to learn um, that I said I can definitely fill a whole year um, with with the curriculum and the content, and I it it became quite popular um, to the point that um, I had over a hundred students last year in four sections in forensics, um, and so I think it was it was successful, and I think um, I think the students really did learn a lot 
Um, I ran the class in a way that was pretty relaxed. Um, I don't, I don't, it, at this point, it's, it's open to 11th and 12th graders who have already had um, quite a bit of science. Um, and I kind of wanted that because it's required for a lot of things. But the students were coming in thinking, gosh, you know, it's forensic science. I've seen this on TV. It, it, you know, it's not hard. Where's the science in forensic science? And so I kind of took that on as, as my responsibility to teach them that there was indeed a lot of science behind forensic science. So um, Janelle, can you scroll to the next one, please? It's a PDF, I apologize, but that's, I think. Um, so again, where's the science behind the forensics? Um, forensic science by definition, uh, um, also known as criminalistics, is really the application of science um, to matters of the law, both criminal and civil. civil. Um, and in this sense, just applying the scientific process and a way of thinking um, with the techniques to matters of crime. So it really is quite literally science, but it's taking science into the courtroom. Um, and the biggest challenge um, in, in that is getting the jurors and the lawyers and the judges to really kind of enter into your world as a scientist. Um, you know, this is um, you know, the, the, the lawyers um, and the, the legal professionals um, really are gifted with words um, and are usually quite good at critical thinking and, you know, maneuvering through. But when you start to try to describe somebody the process of PCR analysis or DNA fingerprinting or the, um, you know, the, the, the way that blood reacts when it hits wood versus carpet or, or something like that, um, you know, you tend to lose them. Um, and so especially um, in a case where it, it can really, really kind of add up in terms of the scientific processes and the testing that goes along with it. Um, and then again, too, with the jurors, they, they may have only had a nice high school education or maybe not even a high school education, or they may be experts in their own field, but you need to get them comfortable with the techniques that you believe in that you're actually trying to use to prove or disprove, um, you know, in criminal or civil cases. Um, so that really is what forensics is, but it is it in essentially um, itself, it is science. Um, go to the next one, please. Um, so this is just a little bit of a historic. It's a very busy slide, and I appreciate. I, I, I'm sorry that that it it might be visually difficult. Um, so just bear with me. But um, just historically, in terms of bringing science into the courtroom, these are the two cases that all forensics um, scientists kind of know about. Um, it's it's one of the first things you learn when you take a forensic science course. But back in 1923, um, th there was a um, an awareness in the courtroom that, you know, somebody could just come in and say, no, 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 this is true. This is how I did it. So you have to believe me because this is, this is what I did. And these are the results I got. Um, and that actually is not really um, the scientific process. It has to be something that is um, proved that's reliable, that can be um, um, uh, repeated in, you know, in the lab. Um, and it has to be uh, the technique or, or the, 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 the actual testing that they do needs to be um, peer approved um, by other scientists and other people in, in, in the community. Um, so in 1923, Fry versus the United States, um, they kind of ruled that the expert opinion based, it has to be based on a scientific technique and is only admissible when that technique is generally accepted by the scientific community. So it can't just be, hey, I tried this new technique and I'm gonna prove that he's guilty. Um, and so that was that was the first ruling was that the Fry versus the U.S. in 1923. Then later on, 1993, and then successfully 1997 and 1999, um, there was a ruling in um, a Dobert case, what they call, um, and they came up with um, some some further regulations for the Fry standard. Um, in which case, the judge says the judge is the gatekeeper. Um, what that means is the judge has final say in any um, debate uh, between the, the community, scientific community, and the legal community. Um, that this technique or that this new science method um, has to have relevance and reliability. Um, that there has to have been used the scientific method or methodology in proving this and using it. And then we have these four other factors that absolutely must um, have, have to be met, must be met. Um, in order for this particular um, new scientific method to be introduced into, into the courtroom. Um, it has to be subjected to peer review. 
Um, it has to be um, tested and retested and repeatable. Um, it has to have a known error rate and um, it has to be, uh, the research has to be conducted independent of any litigation or um, can it be dependent on the intention to provide testimony. So basically it can't be like, hey, I want you to learn or, or come up with a new method so you can prove this to be correct. So we do in class talk a little bit, Must we must talk a little bit about um, the legal aspects. Um, and I tell my students a lot of times, um, you have to understand what can be ad admissible in court so that you as forensic investigators can find the right evidence to put into court. It needs to have probative value. Um, and so we talk a little bit about the union between the court and, um, and the science behind it. So that is forensics. Um, so this is our history behind what, what we're really working with in terms of um, joining or marrying the legal community with the scientific community. Um, go ahead and scroll, or do I have, I don't have that, yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Um, so kind of the lure here today and the lure that I use for my students is that I know that the students sign up when they sign up for forensic science that they've watched crime television. Um, and I know that most of us get sucked into something um, crime related on TV sometimes. And so we talk about um, uh, uh, this, this something that's called the CSI effect. Um, and this is sort of a documented thing. And, you know, we we in the scientific community in terms of forensics um, know that this is something that is somewhat fictional. But um, as a definition, the CSI effect is um, any of several ways in which the exaggerated portrayal of forensic science on crime television shows. It, it really what it means is when you're watching, I don't know, a Dexter or, a, you know, a CSI itself. Um, you know, it has to fit into an hour. And so, you know, people will get all this evidence and they have their suspect and then they get all the, like the fingerprints and the DNA and they send it off to the lab and it gets tested and it comes back like within 12 to 24 hours and boom, they have their suspect or whatever. Um, it does not happen like that. And um, in fact, it can take, even with a simple fingerprint analysis, you know, hey, can you match this? Can you send it to the computer base and see if you can get a match? Um, that can take upwards of six months months to a year. Um, and so I just need to sort of get out there that this is not really how it happens. Yes, that is the protocol, but the timing of it is extremely exaggerated. Um, and so we talk about this and we talk about why maybe, you know, um, it takes so long and why there's such a, a, a disparity. Obviously, the shows are fictional, um, but this is the one thing that I want to dispel when the students come in is it is not this easy and it doesn't go as quickly as you think. And it's not as cut and dry always. Um, so next one, please. So in class. I ask my students, um, they're, they're asked to know and to understand the science behind each of the types of evidence um, that are used to solve crimes. And so first thing we do is talk about the difference between the types of evidence. Um, and for, for the most case, we'll be talking about what is considered circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial itself um, kind of has gained this negative um, connotation to it because you hear in these in the television shows and things that you know well, that's just circumstantial um, circumstantial evidence is primarily most of what you see um, it is considered indirect evidence um, versus direct evidence direct evidence is um, testimony um, video surveillance anything that directly links somebody or a, a confession um, anything that directly links somebody but direct evidence doesn't happen very often. So indirect evidence is everything else. And that is what they call circumstantial. The more circumstantial evidence you have, the better you can make your case. Um, and so we talk a little bit about that and we talk about what counts as evidence and what doesn't and why and why not. Um, and for example, um, um, uh, a lie detector test does not count as evidence. It is not admissible in court. It counts for gathering information, but it is inadmissible in court. And that's because it is a physiological response that can be controlled in some sense. And it's not necessarily trusted as a reliable um, piece of evidence that is in court. However, it can sort of direct 
um, a, a, a group um, in terms of an investigation one way or the other. Um, we also talk about how to properly preserve the evidence because if it's not preserved properly, then it's not going to be something that can be used later on. We talk about the chain of custody um, in terms of, you know, once you preserve this evidence, it has to go into a certain space. And when it's checked out, it has to be signed out, date, time, person, all of that stuff. Um, and then we talk about what information can be gained from each piece of evidence. And here we again, we talk about class versus individual, and we have something called the product rule. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, but class versus individual, just to give you an example, um, class evidence is something that rules out or rules in a specific group of people. For example, um, they found a, 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 a white t-shirt, so it could rule out everybody that wasn't wearing a white t-shirt that day, for example. Or it could be something like if you have blood, um, it could be blood type, and blood type will rule in a certain group of people. Um, and also exclude everybody else that doesn't have that blood type. Whereas individual evidence would be something like fingerprints or DNA that is actually individual. Um, the product rule just means the more class evidence you have. Um, for example, if, if someone has a witness says, I saw the person, they had blonde hair, wearing a white t-shirt, um, dark sneakers and blue jeans. If you group all of the people that actually have all four of those, you kind of can sort of, you actually literally multiply those numbers and you kind of narrow it down in terms of the probability that it was that person or that it wasn't that person. So it, it class evidence, even though it doesn't directly point at somebody, still holds a lot of value if you can compile enough of it, if that makes sense. Um, and please, if you guys have questions, jot them down and I can try to clarify um, at the end here. Um, next one, Janelle, please. This is just an example of all of the different kinds of things that can fall under forensic science. Um, these are all, and it's, it's certainly not exhaustive. It's just something that I, I tend to show my students because every every time we we gather, we talk about what's your favorite subject in school? What are you good at? Um, it could be something that you it's not even in school, but that it's something that you love and want to do. And I try to really impress upon everybody that anything can have um, a place in, in terms of um, being a science um, in the way that you look at it, in the way that you approach it, in the way that you study it. And you can become an expert in anything. And if you become that expert, you can become an expert witness um, and, and be part of um, uh, the judicial process. Um, so I show everybody we've got language arts and social studies and chemistry, um, general science in terms of just um, study skills and problem solving skills, obviously technology, um, physics, um, we talk, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, language arts is one that people don't generally think of, um, but communication, um, written and oral communication skills, your writing um, um, method, if you will, or your style of, of word use. Um, is, is, a, is a big one that we have a particular case that we study on that one. And of course, social studies in terms of law, um, but psychology, um, forensic history. So there's a lot that can go into this. And I feel like when I show students this, they really sort of become invested because they all find something in there that they think, oh, hey, I didn't realize that, you know, my, my, my love for um, uh, mixing sound and music might help me in voice analysis and forensics. So it's kind of interesting in that sense. Um, next slide, please. So here I have just sort of the best topics for teaching in forensics in terms of teaching science, and then maybe not so best, if you will. Um, and it's not that they're not scientific, and I'll get to that, but um, but this is my list. So the, the, the topics that I enjoy teaching the most because they have a lot of science behind them, a lot of teachable science for high school kids, um, would be um, estimating time of death, um, our blood spatter unit, DNA fingerprinting, and then anthropology. Um, and the topics that I... I still cover, but that aren't the best for teaching at this point or this level um, would be ballistics, impression analysis, handwriting analysis, and odontology and bite marks. Um, and I'll explain some of that in a little bit. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna get, kind of go quickly here and down the list of what's best for teaching science in forensic science and where the science actually lies behind all of this. Um, and I'm gonna start with blood spatter. 
And so on the left, obviously, this is what we're talking about, blood spatter. We call it serology. And then we talk about spatter patterns. Um, and so in terms of teaching the blood spatter and the blood serology unit or the serology unit, um, the science behind it involves um, understanding, teaching and understanding both red blood cell, white blood cell ratio in blood. What is the composition of blood? Really, really important here to understand the composition of blood for several reasons. Um, I get to teach um, about antigens, antibodies, um, when we learn about blood types, um, which also brings in genetics. And once we learn the genetics of, of inheriting a blood type, um, which is a co-dominant um, um, sort of pattern in genetics. Um, I have the kids practice at learning um, paternity and we do little Punnett squares um, and determine, you know, if someone was a, like adopted or illegitimacy um, or if, you know, if there's a particular um, blood type left at a scene, did it belong to the family or not? So they have fun with that. Um, and then we get to talk about the properties of water, take them all the way back to their biology roots. Um, we talk about the forces of cohesion, adhesion, surface tension, and force those forces relative to outside forces like velocity of, um, a, a, of a, a weapon coming at you or just gravity. Um, and then we move on to spatter patterns, and that's where we bring in velocity and force. We talk about anatomy, like depending on what part of your body um, is, is going to be bleeding, um, what kind of weapon it's going to be. Um, and then we talk about the spatter pattern that's left behind. What can you tell from that? The angle of incidence. And here we add in sine, cosine, and tangent, where we actually will calculate angle of incidence and the height coming back to it using, um, using our, um, our, our, our trigonometry there. So there's definitely science behind the blood spatter unit um, and quite a bit of it. And of course, the kids get to play with fake blood too. So um, next one, please. Estimating time of death is probably my favorite unit to teach. Um, and again, why is this one best? Um, there's a lot of science behind this one as well. Um, we talk first about the stages of decomposition, um, which is always fun because we get to show the whole body farm show. Um, and then we talk about the body farm itself. And if you don't know about it, the University of Tennessee Body Farm is where they actually have um, donated human bodies. Um, and they actually study decomposition in different stages and different environments. Um, and um, they've learned a lot from that. It was um, started in back in the mid 80s, 1980s. So, um, and in that we talk about environmental science, meaning, you know, the, the different effects that weather have on, on and climate have on the decomposition of a body. Um, we obviously talk about anatomy and physiology and cell biology. Um, I tell the students that they need to understand what happens in the body when it's alive before they can really understand um, how the body sort of shuts down and it shuts down sort of systematically. Um, and in understanding the physiology of how the body works when it's running with its metabolism and its um, skeletal muscle movement, things like that, they begin to understand how it shuts down and why each stage happens the way that it does. Um, then we move on to the mortises, which would be algor, liver, and rigor. Um, in here, we talk again about the environmental science because the, the climate and the, the ambient, you know, um, temperature in the room or um, some of the other factors that are involved um, play a big part in the mortises, um, primarily um, rigor and algor. Um, and again, anatomy and physiology here, cell biology. Um, and then we also talk about algebra because when we talk about algor mortis, which is the cooling of the body, it is a very systematic um, uh, cooling of uh, one and a half degrees per hour for the first 12 hours. And then for, this, for, for any time after 12 hours, it uses a different coefficient of cooling. It's about half that. And so sometimes I have the kids figure out, you know, um, if it's been greater than 12 hours, what was the rate of cooling? They use those different coefficients to, to kind of calculate back to time of death using, you know, regular body temperature when you're alive um, of either 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit. So they, they don't always like doing the algebra, but it is very satisfying when they get it and they use the two different coefficients and have to add back in. So there's some algebra there. And then of course, logical and critic, logic and critical thinking. Um, we talk a little bit about stomach contents, um, which obviously takes us back to um, anatomy, physiology, 
um, the stomach and the digestive system is a very regulated um, sort of uh, time clock. Um, and if there's nothing in the stomach, then we know how long um, if there's, but if there's something in the small intestine or large intestine, um, so we can time things back that way. And then entomology is another one that we talk about in terms of um, estimating time of death. And that is literally looking at the life cycle, mostly of blowflies, but other insects as well. So we talk a little bit about that too. So there's a lot of science behind, behind determining time of death. And determining time of death is probably one of the most important things um, that a forensic scientist can do if you have, um, if, if that's your kind of case, if that's the case that you're on. Um, that is probably the most important thing that needs to be done. And you can really narrow it down to a pretty tight window, and then you can check alibis and whereabouts of, of your suspects. Um, next one, please. DNA fingerprinting is another one that has quite a bit of science behind it, and it's a lot of fun to teach because of that. Um, again, when you're watching a TV show or a movie or something like that, they literally are like, they just got their sample and they're gonna say it was hair or blood, that drives me crazy. Um, and, and all of a sudden they've got this sort of banding pattern and it's like, yep, that's your, that's your girl or that's your guy. Um, it, there's a lot that goes into this. Um, so for the students to understand what's happening, we go back to what is DNA, where is it found, um, which would be, you know, um, talking to them about, they all say it's in the nucleus of the cell. They remember that from biology, but there's also mitochondrial DNA. I introduce them to that and what's the difference between nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA. So we get into some gen genetics. Um, and then we talk about red blood cells and hair because um, when you scoop up a little drop of blood off of a crime scene, if it's, if it's just a tiny amount of blood, the students will understand at that point, since we've studied blood, that only the white blood cells in that blood sample are the ones that contain nuclear DNA. Um, red blood cells don't have nuclei, they don't have DNA. Plasma, there's no DNA. So in a sample of blood, there's a tiny, tiny fraction of cells that actually contain the DNA. So um, I think it's interesting for students to, to, to sort of discover that, hey, that's not as easy as it seems. Um, and then hair, people are always like, oh, you can get DNA from that. And you can't. Um, unless the follicle from your hair being pulled out is still attached. Um, if that hair follicle with the skin tag still on it, it's, it's, if that's not available on that hair sample, then you're not going to get nuclear DNA. If you just have a little piece of hair cut, you can only get mitochondrial DNA. And that's only going to tell you a maternal side of the family. Um, DNA fingerprinting obviously also talks about molecular biology and chemistry. We use agarose gels, we use buffers, um, and why does DNA travel through an agarose gel from plus to minus, or um, we talk about electrochemistry, um, and that introduces us to the Innocence Project, um, and that is the group um, that actually takes old cases of um, of inmates who are convicted that insist that they are innocent, they go back. Um, and they were all convicted before this DNA fingerprinting method was available. And so the Innocence Project as a group will go back and revisit um, their um, the, the, the samples that they have of their evidence and they will run it, um, run their DNA profiles on it. And um, a lot of people have been exonerated because of the Innocence Project. So a lot of science behind that one. And then lastly, Janelle, would you do anthropology, please? Uh, my, my best topic for teaching science would be anthropology. And again, this is the study of bones. Um, and so we need to know the anatomy, physiology, we need to know developmental stages. Um, again, chemistry and toxicology can be done on bones. Um, pathology and disease can be found for our bones. Um, so the students learn that you can tell the age of a victim, you can tell um, the sex of the victim, and you can tell different diseases. You can tell if you have the right bones, if it was a female, you can tell if they've had children or not. Um, oftentimes you can tell if they're right-handed or left-handed if you have the right bones. And our favorite case for this one, um, you can tell height and weight. Um, but their favorite case for this one is the John Wayne Gacy case. Um, and you may be familiar with that one where he um, was a serial killer and um, buried the bodies of his victims underneath his house. And when they finally um, uh, really started to, to excavate, um, there were just, it was just bones, 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 bones. And so they had to systematically sort of um, categorize and test each of the bones to find out which victim it, they went with. Um, and so we have a little sort of um, project that we do on that one as well. 
So um, next slide, please. This is the last little bit. These are the topics that I say that are not the best for teaching science. And again, it's not that there's not science here. I just say they're not the best. There is science behind each of these. And the, these analyses are certainly carried out by experts in their field. But to the public, these particular ones appear to be strictly comparisons. Um, and that's the hard part. And for me, without a comprehensive background, I can only teach these in our classroom as a comparison. Um, and I hope that makes sense to you. But again, ballistics is matching bullets with the, the gun barrel itself. Um, and, you know, without being an expert in that field, that's really all I can do. And of course, that's not something I'm going to bring into school at this point anyway, um, although I can bring in some experts. Um, impression analysis would be something like a tire impression or a shoe impression. It does seem to be strictly matching, but there is more to it. It's just that I don't teach it. It's it's not something that really interests them, and it's not something that I have a lot of um, um, expertise in. Um, handwriting analysis, we do. It's fun, but there's not a lot of science behind it, um, but it is a fun one. Um, and then odontology and bite marks. Um, again, there is science behind it, um, but there's there's not a lot for me to teach, and I'm not an expert in that. Um, but our famous case that we talk about in that one would be, um, um, oh gosh, now I just went because somebody just came home. Um, uh, what was his name? Now I can't think of it. Um, Ted Bundy. That's it. Um, he was actually convicted on bite mark analysis. So um, next slide, please. So again, we go back to the CSI effect. So there's a lot that goes into um, the tests that they show on the TV um, and on the movies. Um, and so I just try to like to dispel that myth a little bit. Um, um, teaching forensic science is a lot of fun. You do need to know science to learn some of the science. But I think in this case, it's fun to um, to apply the information that you learned, um, let's say genetics for a student who didn't really understand why they needed to learn genetics. This is a nice way of actually applying it and having fun with it um, and actually making it relevant. So next one, please. Um, that's it. So dispelling the myth. Um, I don't know why this isn't in one place, but you know, how do you dispel that CSI effect? Um, it's just as essentially just these tests that are just glorified. Um, investigators, again, they do the DNA from a small, small drop of blood or hair. Um, and again, now you know that it has to be a very specific sample for that to actually happen. And they get their results in 12 or 24 hours. And that actually is just not how it happens. Um, is that my last one, Janelle? I think it is. It is. Yes. Okay. I hope that wasn't too fast and too crazy for you guys. Um, questions? I'm going to bring my video back. Yeah, you can take this one off. <laughs> Amy, tell me about your most notable project that your kids work on. What do they have the most fun learning by doing in your classroom? Um, you know, it's changed over the years. I've done several different projects, um, but I think that the one that they have the most fun with is um, I end my year with, um, or I had, maybe not this year because I'm doing a semester class again, but I end with um, a create a crime scene. And so um, I've had students, and they get to work in groups if they want to, but I've had students, um, they have to recreate a crime scene. And for the most part, I try to encourage them to create their own story and then create the crime scene. And then I have students kind of guess. And that was how we did it the first year. A couple of students wanted to recreate um, some of the other scenes. And I, I let them do that. They were obvious though to other students. And so, um, but I've had some amazing projects come through my door. Um, and one I still have that I think you know about, but it was, they went to the wood shop and actually built a home that um, the whole house, and it had a first floor, second floor windows, um, the whole front of it had a hinge and it opened up. Um, and then the rooftop lifted up also. They had um, plastic for the windows and little window panes. They had, I'm not going to describe the scene because it was pretty gross. <laughs> they were very imaginative, but they had a bathtub and a downstairs. And so they had to have like little evidence cards and little footprints and, you know, all of the things, all of the clues, everything there. And then they had to have the story and then they had to have um, a, a description of the evidence cards and the evidence that they had. And the kids love it. They're very good at it. They're very creative um, and they're really, really good projects. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the favorite. Awesome. We have one question from Dr. Valerie Hall, former Nantucket High School educator. All right. Yes. On 
On one Law and Order Special Victims episode, they found the killer by tricking him to have a cup of coffee. Would there really be enough DNA on the discarded paper cup to conduct a reliable test? It's a great question. Probably, probably. See, now the thing about about leaving saliva behind is that and that actually is cells. You're going to have cells. Um, saliva itself is not quite, but it's going to contain cells. And anytime you contain regular body cells, you're going to have nuclear DNA. Um, and even if you just have a tiny bit, even if it's just like a buccal swab or a cheek swab, that's going to give you cells with the, um, the, the use of PCR analysis, which is just taking a small tiny bit of DNA and amplifying it. When you can ampl amplify that DNA, then you can run it. And you probably theoretically can get enough from that, probably more than you'd get from a piece of hair <laughs> or a drop of blood. So that's a very good question, but that one, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So Val, it looks like SVU checks out with the creation <laughs> yeah. of the scene. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that they're pretty accurate with what they can do. It's just more the timing of, of, of it. Of how yeah. quick the turnaround actually. Kind of, yeah. Other than like, oh, there's hair, you know, I'll collect a hair and I'll get DNA from it. That one still bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair. We have a couple of questions coming in. So I'm going to move through some of them from Benton. Are there any kinds of forensic analysis techniques they show on TV that we actually can't do? Um, Benton with the oh, stumper, of course. I know. I, I'm going to say no, um, because I feel like TV, they, they, they really are pretty accurate um, with what they can do. And they, I mean, to be honest, some of the techniques out there right now are really amazing. Um, you know, we talk about fingerprints. Um, as just looking at the ridge patterns and, you know, making sure that they, they match. Um, but, but the technology now is really so amazing that you can actually take a fingerprint and you can get um, the metabolites that like the person is metabolizing, like coming out in their sweat. You can pick up those chemicals and you can actually learn from, from the fingerprint the medication the person's on, um, things that they may have touched recently, um, like uh, you know a latex glove or something like that, you get those um, that residue and any metabolites that are coming out. Um, so, you know, if it seems extreme on TV, it's probably cutting edge and it's probably out there. So I'm going to say um, that um, you know, other than some of the, the the things in terms of sort of gross simplifications like getting DNA from, you know, from things like that, um, that I'd say, yeah, that's probably pretty accurate. I think they've got a lot of good people working on those shows and I watch them. I try to, I try to find the, the things, but I think, so, yeah, yeah. So we can do it, but just probably not in that quick. Well, definitely not that quickly. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's a TV show. I get it. You know, you want to wrap it up. <laughs> they have to hook us in for the full like 50 <laughs> minutes that they have us for. <laughs> yeah. From Charles, do colleges offer forensics as a major? Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. Not all of them. Um, Penn State has a fantastic program. Um, that would be the one that I would probably, if somebody was really gifted and interested, I would I would steer them toward. But other schools do as well. Obviously, University of Tennessee, which is where the body farm is. Um, you know, certainly they're not in all schools, but yes, it is a major. Tell us more about the body farm. You just knocked that one in there. I know the body farm. So um, Dr. Bill Bass, um, you know, he was a, uh, for, he was an anthropologist actually. And he was, he was asked to consult on a case and um, years and years ago, and he messed it up so badly um, that he was shocked. You know, he was like, he was sure that, that, that his timing was right. Like how old is this bone? And he gave like a, you know, a timeline and it turns out it was a hundred years before that. And he was so shocked in his, in his misunderstanding and misreading of that, that he was like, we need to know more. And so he founded this place called the body farm. And he was teaching at university of Tennessee at the time still does. Um, and so he, he got donated some acreage on the university and then had, um, you know, bodies that are donated to science. And they literally will now put those bodies out in the open um, in different conditions, like clothed or covered or in a car or buried in cement or whatever, um, and actually study the rate of decay and the conditions. Um, and it has gained such popularity that they are now um, creating body farms in different um, climate 
you know, areas in, in the United States. Um, so Arizona is one um, in the Pacific Northwest is another because of their, their difference in climates. They want to see sort of the effects um, on, on different climates and, you know, heat and dry and wet and all of that. So the body farm, yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> it's pretty unique, but I love that they've now branched out to recreate and simulate those different climates and environments to see the different conditions that they have on the body. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Question from Robert or comment with a question. I appreciate your message to the students that this subject requires a wide array of skills, including writing and persuasive arguments. Mm -hmm. In our astronomy research seminars, we have discovered that the kids who are good at writing are often crit critical to the success of their teams. Without them, the final paper may not have come across the finish line. So more of a comment than a question. It is a comment, but I absolutely agree. And I, um, it's really hard to get the kids to write. Um, especially in an argumentative situation. Um, I do have one lesson that I do for argumentative writing that has to do with a shaken baby um, and about, um, I, I purposely don't give them enough information to come up with an actual sort of, you know, um, true, you know, um, answer, I suppose, but it has to do with, um, I'll give them uh, some, some details about the spine and about, they have to look up things that are, that are common for that age of child and all of that thing. And I really try to get them to come up with sides and kind of work on it. And, and some of them really are good at it. And some of them you can tell just aren't confident enough, but I always tell them, if you can't communicate it, you don't know it well enough. And that's, that's sort of my measure, but I absolutely agree that that um, the, the communication part of it and in, in writing in, in a sense, but, you know, again, if you can't, and certainly if you can't teach it to somebody else, then you need to make sure that you understand it a little bit better. But so it seems like in the curriculum, and I might have an unfair advantage of knowing <laughs> how we, we run our courses, but it seems like forensic science is ultimately a culminating science because it brings in so many of the other courses that students are required to take as well as that they happen to take as electives. But do you think that there is room and opportunity for it to be a launch pad science at all? Uh, I do, oh. of course, absolutely. I do. In fact, um, it, and it's funny that you said that because you're not with me this year, but I am teaching a new course this year, the principles of biomedical science, and our first unit was all forensics. Okay. Um, and those students, um, I'd say um, all but one have had biology, one is in biology right now, mm -hmm. uh, but those students um, really haven't had much science. Um, mm -hmm. And yet um, I'm able to take them through a crime scene. Um, they documented it. They did everything that you're supposed to do. Um, they took um, samples of the hair, samples of the blood, samples of the liquid that was found, and they did toxicology on the, you know, the, the, the medication she was taking and on the, um, on the liquid. And they um, ran um, DNA analysis and they did, um, um, uh, they did blood typing, and that was that was all with students that that really hadn't had a lot of science background yet. Um, so in that sense, um, they actually then were able to go all the way through. They looked at um, uh, what she they were trying to figure out what she died from, um, and whether it was um, criminal or not, um, in terms of murder or accidental or natural. Um, and they were able to go all the way through. They looked at um, slides of her brain. They looked at her heart to try to figure it out. And they were able, all of them, able to figure out that it was um, it was not a homicide, that it was an accident, and that she actually had um, a, a defect in her heart that caused her to pass out, hit her head. And so it was, it was a fantastic unit. And those students um, really, I think, from there, you know, would be interested in something. It's really more or less just to sort of... Um, introduce them to mm -hmm. this as a possibility. So yeah, absolutely. I'm just always fascinated because it forensic science, I feel like has so much potential and not in a limiting sense, but so much potential to really hook students into the anatomy and the physiology, into the chemistry. And me as a chemist, I definitely see the chemistry opportunities there. Yeah. Um, definitely the biology, the underlying fundamental science, but it was just a curious question. <laughs> well, and, the, and the, what's interesting about it too, though, is, I mean, I tell people, you know, if, uh, we have a lot of very good artists at school, mm -hmm. kids that sit and draw. Um, and that is a very, very important skill. Mm -hmm. um, kids that are good at photography, 
um, because getting the perspective at crime scenes is really important to changing the lighting of things so that some things can come, you know, can come to the foreground um, is really important. Kids that understand phones and technology. I mean, there's, there's, there's literally something for everybody. Um, you know, uh, not, it doesn't have to just be science stuff, right. it could be anything in any walk of life that you apply the scientific method to mm -hmm. in the way that you think critically about it. So, so it's almost like forensic science is the flagship or the poster child for steam. It is actually all of the, you know, absolutely, so. absolutely. And there's, you know, there's, there's definitely, um, I think some of the kids, uh, one of the topics that we we kind of brush over because I don't know that much about it. I'm not schooled in that would be um, structural engineering. Mm -hmm. um, there is a big, big, you know, field for students that understand structural engineering, um, you know, in terms of building collapse, um, you know, uh, FAA, you know, accidents, things like that. Um, and then there's also, there's a lot of math behind a lot of it as well in terms of like, well, definitely in the blood spatter unit, but also in the, you know, the, the coefficients in the algor mortis and stuff. So um, absolutely. Yeah. Steam. <laughs> steam. We love steam. <laughs> One question from Robert Hall. Where did Dr. Hinson get trained in forensics? Um, right there at Nantucket High School. <laughs> That's the funny thing. Um, it, I, I don't, I'm not trained in forensics, but I, I've learned um, over the years, you know, when, when someone throws you in and says, you must teach this, um, you must learn it first. And so mm -hmm. I have learned a lot over the years and I've done a lot of research. And I've always said too, funny, um, if anybody searched my history on my computer at school, they would be shocked because of the things that I need to sort of, you know, sort of research. Um, but I think that, yeah, I mean, you learn by doing. Um, and, you know, I've watched a lot and I do watch a lot of the shows because it, in many cases, it makes me think, oh, well, first of all, maybe I can use that as a, as a case study, um, either in what to do or what not to do. Um, but also because it helps me. And of course, I'm a researcher by trade. So as soon as I find something or hear something that I don't know, I will research it until I understand it and can teach it. Um, but yeah, I've got my training right here at Nantucket High School. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you mentioned learning by doing because it's definitely Mariah Mitchell's way and it just feels very serendipitous that we all get to share time and space on Nantucket and we've all found our way here and we really live the ethos of learning by doing so I am really humbled that you just shared that little tidbit. <laughs> One other thought that just came into my mind. Tell me about your background in your undergraduate research, your postgraduate research. How do you or where do you think those skills have really lended to you developing your forensic science course and even your other courses at Nantucket High School? I mean, I think I definitely have a love for learning. Um, I, I don't know that that I think it's both, you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing, um, you know, because it never ends. Um, and sometimes you kind of want it to. <laughs> um, but it, you know, I, I don't know. I think um, I think I've always sort of just been that person that was encouraged to ask why or figure out why not just ask why it wasn't. In, in fact, that was probably the wrong wording because my dad was never satisfied if I just ask, he wasn't ever going to just give me the answer. Neither was my mom. And it was always sort of like, that's a great question. You go answer that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and then of course I was also, you know, kind of a latchkey kid left alone, you know, not in a bad way, but you know, I mean, right. Gen X, it's, it's what we were, it's what we did. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I learned by doing, um, and had to kind of, you know, come up with explanations on my own. And I think that sort of in some ways really fostered, you know, that independent researcher part of me. Um, and then maybe part of it is just the way that, you know, I was raised in terms of logical thinking. I mean, my mom was an educator, but she was a math teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and then of course, having dad um, there to um, sort of foster that. But, um, you know, college was sort of this, um, I found out I was pretty good at something and I figured, well, that's probably what I should go toward, you know, um, but, but I will say that my parents, my dad actually influenced that in many ways and not so much in a good way, but it was, he was definitely that person that was kind of the big biotechnology boom at that time mm -hmm. in the, you know, mid eighties. Um, and he was just like, you know, you can go and do whatever it is that you enjoy doing, but I want you to major in something you can get a job in. It was, mm -hmm. you know, very pragmatic in that sense. And so, because biotechnology was kind of really the cutting edge. It was like, well, you're good at it. So you might as well do it. Then I had 
this phenomenal professor when I was in college. Um, he was my, um, he was a chemistry professor, but he was the chemistry professor. So it was chemistry, organic chemistry, physical chemistry, inorganic chemistry, you know, PCHEM, all of that. Well, I said that one. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 he just kind of set me aside one day and said, you know, um, you can do this. You're really good at this. And if, you know, if you, if you, if you take these measures, you can go to graduate school. And I was just like, what are you talking about? So he really fostered that, that sort of, um, or ignited, I suppose, that spark to to take it further, you know. And you know, those of us that have been through college, you kind of know when you finally graduate with the degree, you know, in biochemistry. That meant I had had only a year of biochemistry. Mm -hmm. That was enough, you know. You know, there's more out there. So, um, so I went on to graduate school, and and I loved my courses in, in the first two years of graduate school. Of course, that's you take courses your first two years, and then you do research. Mm -hmm. But I loved taking those courses, um, and they just felt so. They were exciting and it was to the point where it's like you had like a, a a physical chemistry problem that was given to you and it was you get so into it that you find yourself like waking up in the middle of the night because you've just dreamt about the solution do you know it's i had those moments and it was fantastic um and then I, I i chose my research in my field and it was in the field of neuroscience and neurodegenerative diseases and you know it just kind of just kind of went along and um, I'm still learning about it. You know, every time I teach the nervous system unit, I go back to that and I, you know, you kind of see where the advances are because you want to teach your students about that. Um, I don't know, does that answer the question? I mean, it kind of takes you all the way through, but um, but I think it it just means every time I, I hear about something, the first thing I do is research it so that I can know more about it so that I can either make my own informed decision about something that I want to do or don't want to do or whatever, or, or teach my students about it, you know, because I can't just stay in the past. Like, well, this is how it's always done. It's like, yeah, I want to be able to show them the relevance of what right. they're learning. So. And do you feel like your students are picking up on that transferable skill? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think they are. I think um, I think I can find enough topics that are relevant to them. And I feel like I really listen to um, to the why behind their questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of students in anatomy, especially will come in with with questions about something that, you know, either about them or, you know, even if it's something like, hey, I dislocated my shoulder. I'm like, oh, my gosh, send me the x-ray, you know, that thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and then we talk about excuse me different things. I I really try to be in tune with, with what they might be interested in because I'm not teaching to a test, and right. I don't have to get anywhere at the end of the year. So they're able to just you know I'm like if this is what interests you let's let's take let's go down this path for you know a couple of steps and and take a look. So um, I I think so. I think I can I can kind of pick up and and help them sort of understand the application behind why they should learn this which I think is a step in the right direction removed from like their freshman biology course. Cause it's just this fast and furious. Like, why do I even need to know this? Right. I would agree. We don't get to tell them why we don't have time. Correct. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. We have one more question from Robert Hall. Do you have textbooks for yourself or for your students? Hmm. Um, I, I do. Um, my students don't use the textbooks very much, but I follow the textbooks in in what I teach. Um, and I, I can I have a classroom set and I can always like it's chapter it's chapter 11 or it's chapter two or it's chapter three. Um, the textbook's phenomenal. It doesn't go into a whole lot of detail, which is why I like it, because the chapters are very short to the point. Mm -hmm. They usually have quick little case studies and I will sometimes use the text. Um, but I teach way beyond the text um, and I use a lot of case studies. Um, and there are there's a lot of good databases out there for um, case studies that they've turned into really good like sort of high school teaching things. In fact, next week I'm going to be doing um, in my forensics class. Um, we're doing a finger the fingerprint unit right now, um, and our case study next week is the Tylenol murders, um, which is just a phenomenal case. Um, and she was finally caught. There's a lot of things that are intricate intricate parts to it, like. Um, you know, toxicology and the testing of things and, and, you know, sort of the, the, sort of the overall, the FBI getting involved because it's a, a you know, a, a global, it could have been a global issue. She don't really know at that point for distribution, um, but it comes down to fingerprints. 
that she on a book even. So we talk about how to lift fingerprints from paper versus, you know, hard surfaces and stuff. Um, But I do have textbooks. Um, I have anatomy textbooks as well, but you know, um, the text is, is nice to have, but we don't necessarily open up a book all the time and read it. Um, But it is, I follow it. I don't know. I don't know if I really use it the way I should, but um, I think there's more to it than just that. And the students, they need more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, I do have a text that I follow and it's it's a great text. I've got actually a couple of different ones, but the one that I like is by um, Bertino is the author. Um, and it's it's probably my favorite version of, of the forensics books that are out there. And Millie said, fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing from well, Anne. Thank you guys for listening. It's Always fun to find somebody else that likes to listen to (laughs) sciencey stuff. (laughs) Definitely. I have one more kind of thought or question. It sounds like there's a lot of opportunity for deep enrichment and cross collaboration across the various department offerings that are available at Nantucket High School. Because you mentioned for one of your projects, the kids built their project in Woodshop class. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a math that goes into the Alba Mortis Mm -hmm. and of course the different science courses what would be your recommendation? And I'm just brainstorming for creating maybe like a launching pad science, forensic science course that incorporates maybe a unit or an engulfing unit that focuses on all of those skill sets so that kids who are not necessarily sciencey, and I say that very loosely because everyone is a science and math person and an art person in Mm -hmm. my brain, but, you know, just to really inspire a different perspective from the different viewpoints academically and that was a long-winded thought it was I mean I'm not sure I I, it would be so nice to to create a course where it was it was not just um cross-disciplinary but Mm -hmm. literally cross-collaborative where um where I could take a unit and somebody else could take a unit Mm -hmm. or step in and be part of that unit or you know we could have um I, 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 I know it's there. I have the vision for it. Um, I don't know how to, to actually hardwire it into our schedule and into our curriculum mm-hmm. uh, without having that, th- that be the case for a lot of our classes. It's hard to do it for just one, you know, right. uh, but it, it really wouldn't um, be that difficult, you know, to have sort of a traveling group mm-hmm. you know, um, because you can incorporate, I mean, forensic history is huge you know, uh, it's been around for a very, very long time, this, right. this whole technique um, and, and the applications of it to law. Um, so I think students, first of all, are really interested to find out how old forensic science actually is, um, how far back we can date it. So we can incorporate history and, and the things that are happening in history, the biggest boom in forensics was um, when in the mid 1800s, when, when um, guns became available to mm-hmm. everybody. Um, and so you see like sort of these, you know, swells in history in terms of techniques and things that come about. Um, and of course there's math, of course there's writing because, you know, you want to be, um, you want to be convincing. Um, so when you're talking about putting the matters of science to law, you know, law is, is really all about manipulating words. That's mm-hmm. all it is. It's, it's just a, a way of finding, you know, loopholes, not really, that sounds wrong and, and sort of deceptive, but, but using words to sort of right. manipulate situations. Um, and then of course, math, um, we can use art, we could use digital photography sketches. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's really something there for everybody. Um, and it shouldn't just fall on a science teacher to teach right. that. Um, and it, it just seems like we have a lot of opportunity here in our high school, especially with our diverse course offering, like even throwing criminal justice in there to create some sort of course that interweaves all of these. It's very interdisciplinary that we bring all of these teachers in and almost parallel teach at Mm -hmm. different points of the unit. I just, you know. It would be phenomenal if we had like one big case Mm -hmm. that we could, that, you know, that, that I could design one big case Right. And, you know, for, for this three weeks, you do this in history. Right. Yes. Uh, that, that, that would be like ideal. And it would be like a whole school case kind of thing. And right. I think that it's there. <laughs> like, I think it's possible. It's just, it's, it's Flushing it just beyond, you know, it's just like right at that edge of, of visible to me. Right. I, I absolutely, because it is so, um, it's so all inclusive in terms of what it could, what it could teach. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much, Amy. And Virginia Dell just said, thank you. Very interesting. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you all so much. Make a girl feel good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, no, I just, on behalf of Mariah Mitchell Association and everyone on Nantucket, as well as parents of Nantucket, just thank you so much for all that you do for our kids in the public school system. You are a treasure, genuinely, to our school system. And our kids are so fortunate to have an esteemed and distinguished educator as yourself, leading them through not just forensic science, but just life. Yeah. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I appreciate it. Very nice words indeed. Um, and thank you all so much for listening to forensic science. <laughs> it's fantastic. There is a lot of science in forensic science after all. I'm just going to share our slide again. And it doesn't want to share, so I'll let it ride. But no, I just, again, wanted to, you know, say thank you to you, Amy, for participating in our Science Speaker Series in this lovely rounding up of Women's History Month for the month of March 2023. In theory, every month is Women's History Month in my books. But also a special thank you to our sponsors, our lead sponsor, Bank of America, also our affiliate sponsors, Cisco Brewers and the White Elephant Hotels and Resorts, and Amy Hinson, again, a gracious, gracious thank you from the bottom of my heart. And thank you. Just with a pleasure. Always, always so impressed and astounded by all of the things that circle in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. And did we have two more? We have two more. Hang on. Robert Hall loved it. And Noni Slavitz, this was a real treat to listen to. Noni, you could have just come over. <laughs> just <laughs> <a neighbor. laughs> thank you. Yeah. Of course. Well, everyone, that concludes our March month Science Speaker Series. Thank you so much from the Mariah Mitchell Association for joining us tonight. And if you missed any part of our presentation, it will be available via YouTube, and we will share that link with you forthcoming. Thank you all so much, and have a happy Wednesday night. Noni said she'll come over next time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Amy. I'm going to leave this slide up for a minute, and then I'm going to hop off, and I will follow up with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ames. <laughs>